So hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody all around the world. Thank you for participating on this webinar. My name is Jaime Ponce. I'm a bariatric surgeon in Chattanooga, Tennessee, United States. And um, we're gonna have this exciting webinar that is gonna serve actually as a formal release of the new guidelines from the ASMBS and IFSO on indications uh, for metabolic and bariatric surgery. Exciting times. Um, if you are participating in the event, you can see on the chat two links. Uh, one for the actual article that is being published in SORT and will be published in Obesity Surgery Journal as well. It's an open access uh, article, as well as you're going to see a link for a article that was published today in USA Today. So that's, that's an exciting time. Um, I'm going to have with me uh, my co-moderator, Abdel Rahman Nimeri, and we're going to introduce uh, all the panelists, we're gonna have six talks from leaders from both organizations, the ASMBS and IFSO. So I'm gonna start uh, by introducing uh, three of the panelists. Uh, we're gonna have with us, Dr. Shanuk Kothari, good friend and colleague, uh, chair of surgery at Prisma Health in Greenville, South Carolina. He was actually a past chair of the ASMBS Clinical Issues Committee, which is an important committee to develop guidelines, and he's the immediate past president of the ASMBS. Also, we're going to have with us uh, Scott Shikora. He's a professor of surgery at Harvard, uh, director of the Center for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He's a uh, past president of the ASMBS. He's the current editor-in-chief of Obesity Surgery Journal, and he's our current IFSO president. And also, we're going to have um, Lillian Co. She is uh, the director of the Adelaide Bariatric Center in Adelaide, South Australia. Uh, she is the past president of the Australian and New Zealand uh, Metabolic and Obesity Surgery Society, past president of the ESO Asia Pacific chapter, and also the immediate past president of ESO. So now I'm gonna have Abdel Ramani Mary introducing himself and the rest of the panelists. Um, thank you, Jaime, and hello everyone. Um, uh, Abdel Ramani Mary, it's really my pleasure and privilege to be part of this webinar. So we also have with us today, uh, Gerhard Prager. Uh, Gerhard is the past president of the IFSO European chapter, and he's the president elect of IFSO, professor of bariatric surgery at the Medical University of Vienna in Austria. Uh, welcome, Gerhard. And we have with us uh, Dan Eisenberg. Dan, Dan is an associate professor of surgery at Stanford Medical School and the director of bariatrics at the VA in Palo Alto Healthcare System. He's also the immediate past chair of the same uh, committee that uh, Shanu chaired uh, that Jaime talked about, the important clinical issues committee of ASMBS. Uh, and, and last but not least, we have with us Teresa the master's the current president of ASMBS. She's the medical director of Unity Point uh, Clinic uh, Weight Loss Specialists in uh, West Des Moines, uh, Iowa. And before I, I pass uh, things back to Jaime, I just want to remind everyone uh, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, please use the Q&A uh, uh, function uh, on the Zoom area rather than the chat for the questions. So Jaime, back to you. You're muted, Jaime. Yeah. Now we're going to start the presentations. Uh, first presentation is going to be um, a combination of uh, Shanu Kothari and Skash Shikora. They are going to tell us why do we need bariatric and metabolic surgery guidelines. So first, uh, Shanu. My name is Shanu Kothari. I'm going to be the immediate past president of ASMBS. Many of us are familiar with the 1991 NIH Consensus Conference Guidelines, but we also know how dated these are based on contemporary evidence-based literature that we now have available to us. Let's set the stage and just see where things were in the world in 1991. In the United States, a gallon of gas was $1.12. Average monthly rent was $495 US dollars. It's hard to believe, but that was the year that the World Wide Web was introduced to the world. And in the US, 
our emergency response number 911 was just being tested in the Northwest. Around the world, Canada initiated its national sales tax. The Balkan War started between Slovenia and Croatia as they pulled out of Yugoslavia, two beautiful countries that I've since had the privilege of visiting. And Mikhail Gorbachev resigned as president of the Soviet Union as it ceased to exist. Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of Queen, also passed away of AIDS that year. And you can look at this list of the leaders of various countries in 1991 to see how we have come so far. So what are the benefits of guidelines? Well, ultimately, they are designed to improve health outcomes of our patients. They also improve the consistency of care. And ultimately, we would like to see clinical guidelines help patients by influencing public policy. If we look at the 1991 American College of Cardiology guidelines, we would see that many of the contemporary indications for cardiac catheterization in ambulatory centers um, would not take place now if we, they were trapped with their 31-year-old guidelines, which included anyone over age 75, anyone with severe obesity, anyone with peripheral vascular disease, and anyone with severe diabetes. When you think about that, that's the bulk of patients now getting ambulatory cardiac catheterizations. So they're not trapped with a 31-year-old guideline, but we are. In addition, if we look at the American with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1991, we can see that it was updated in 2010. And when they updated it, they immediately eliminated the original 1991 indications around Americans for Disabilities Act. They suspended it immediately and had to endorse the new 2010 standards. So we are at a precipice now where we too have to abandon our 1991 guidelines. And it's time for us to embrace at this historic moment, our contemporary uh, evidence-based 2022 ASMBS and if so, indications for metabolic and bariatric surgery. Thank you. This is Dr. Scott Shakora, and I'd like to talk about the new ASMBS, if so, guidelines for bariatric and metabolic surgery. Why do we need bariatric metabolic surgery guidelines? Here are my disclosures. None of them have any bearing on this presentation. Prior to 1991, Bariatric and metabolic surgery was almost the wild, wild west. It was considered to be complex surgery performed on complex patients. There was a high morbidity and mortality rate and a high level of recidivism. There were no practice guidelines or standards. Many surgeons were poorly trained to perform these procedures. And there was human experimentation as many surgeons try to develop their own procedures. Most of these were proven to either not be efficacious or were harmful or both, and few of them survive today. There were very few well-designed studies, and I don't believe there were any randomized control trials. There was no societal or governmental oversight. And for that reason, in 1991, the NIH convened a consensus conference of experts to create the criteria for candidacy for bariatric and metabolic surgery. This is just an example of some of the operations that were attempted during that time frame. And as you can see, it's a wide variety of different ideas from uh, gastric wraps to clips, et cetera. And once again, very few of these operations panned out and are with us today. 
The NIH statement defined surgical candidacy. It described the limits of age such that patients below the age of 18 or over the age of approximately 55 were not considered candidates for surgery. Candidates for surgery also had to show repeated failure with non-surgical weight loss attempts, even though the NIH did not spell out what those attempts needed to be. Patients uh, should not have a history of significant psychiatric disorders, but it doesn't talk about whether patients are well controlled on medications. And there was an over-reliance on BMI cutoffs, stating that a BMI of 40 or less in a patient with health would not be a candidate for bariatric surgery, and a BMI of 35 or greater in a patient with diabetes, high blood pressure, et cetera, would also not qualify for surgery. So we were leaving a lot of good candidates out of the uh, mix for having these procedures. The NIH did recognize that the VBG and the gastric bypass were acceptable operative procedures, but they did not include any information on surgeon training or postoperative care. The consensus conference consisted of a panel of experts from all diff different disciplines. Unfortunately, of the 14 individuals on the panel, there was only one practicing surgeon and one retired surgeon. So surgery was dramatically underrepresented for creating the guidelines for surgery. And what the panel did was in writing up their guidelines, they were hoping to find the intersection between risk and benefit. Now, there are limitations to the NIH consensus this, uh, paper. First of all, it relied heavily on BMI, as I've already mentioned. There were no uh, laparoscopic procedures being performed at that time. It was pre-laparoscopic, so all of the surgeries performed were done open with greater risk, and published data was limited. Now, this slide just demonstrates the difference between the 1991 NIH criteria and the just created 2022 ASMBS IFSO guidelines. And the main difference is that the current guidelines, uh, the 1991 NIH ones, relied heavily on opinion and experience with much less science. And the new guidelines put much more emphasis on science and some on best practice with very little on opinion. Now, despite all the advances in bariatric metabolic surgery over the years, the 1991 NIH criteria for surgery has not changed and is still in use today, believe it or not. The benefits of the new guidelines is less reliance on BMI to determine candidacy. Evidence-based uh, medicine was used as the new guidelines do not significantly rely on opinion to determine candidacy. The new guidelines acknowledge that the need to consider patients at lower BMIs as candidates for surgery will occur, particularly for groups such as Asians, where they develop metabolic disease at lower BMIs. The long-term results of bariatric metabolic surgery must consistently demonstrate safety and efficacy. And it supports considering appropriate adolescents and children for BMS surgery. Lastly, the benefits of the new uh, bariatric metabolic surgery guidelines is that it will be applied worldwide. Requirements for creating these guidelines, once again, must be evidence-based, utilizing the latest published literature, must be uh, current, reflecting the state of the specialty at the time, must be free of bias and contain minimal opinion, as previously stated, but can include best practice data such as Adelphi analysis. It needs to be assessed and updated on a regular basis as new procedures and 
technology uh, becomes incorporated in the field. And surgeons must play a leading role in writing these guidelines and not have non-surgeons take that leading role in writing surgical guidelines. The new guidelines should be able to answer questions generated by the practice of bariatric and metabolic surgery. And the new bariatric metabolic surgery guidelines should be accepted by private and governmental health insurance providers. So it's a covered benefit. The new guidelines should be considered the final authority in BMS and replace all other previously published guidelines. The new BMS uh, guidelines should be immediately absorbed by the two major bariatric surgical journals, obesity surgery and surgery for obesity and related diseases. Now, I thought you might, this, you might find this somewhat amusing but this was a quote from an article that was published sometime after the uh, 1991 NIH consensus panel. And I just want to read a couple of sentences out of it because it's very telling. This statement is more than five years old and is provided solely for historical purposes. And they're talking about the 1991 NIH criteria. Due to the cumulative nature of medical research, new knowledge has inevitably accumulated in this subject area in the time since the statement was initially prepared. And here's the zinger. Thus, some of the material is likely to be out of date and at worst, simply wrong. Yet we've been using this since 1991, despite the fact that in 1996, even the NIH determined that the guidelines were probably uh, spoiled at this point. So in conclusion, the currently used criteria for performing bariatric and metabolic surgery served us well, but are now grossly outdated and no longer relevant. The new ASMBS, if so, guidelines reflect the current state of BMS and are also significantly more evidence-based it is therefore necessary and appropriate to retire the 1991 criteria for BMS and implement the new ASMBS if so guidelines. Thank you very much for allowing me to give you this presentation and I hope you enjoy the other presentations that will follow me in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shanu and Scott. Excellent presentation. So I have a question for Shanu quickly. So uh, Shanu, you know that, and you described clearly that the guidelines were needed. And, and I think one of the main reasons that we needed in uh, United States, as you're aware, is access. You know, we have a lot of problems with the insurance companies. But, you know, many other countries may have other reasons why they need the guidelines. You know, they may need it just even for cultural acceptance of metabolic and bariatric surgery, maybe for uh, colleagues' acceptance. Uh, we also know that other countries may have a different uh, payer system than what we have in the United States, you know, national healthcare system. I was just made aware last week that the French National Authority for Health authorized surgery bariatric surgery for patients with BMI between 30 to 35. So that's a big change for France. Um, so do you think there's other reasons why the world may need these guidelines besides access, which is probably one of the main reasons in the United States? Yeah, I think uh, besides access, I think it's just, uh, we have, like I said, we have expanded eligibility requirements. I mean, think about the vast uh, body of literature in the last 30 years that have been contributed as we move from open surgery to the vast majority now being mainly invasive, it's, it's been transformative. And so, um, and now we have uh, level one evidence. We have over a dozen prospective randomized trials showing superiority of metabolic bariatric surgery to maximum medical therapy under the best study design with the highest follow-up of, of, of medical inter, um, intervention. And so uh, the, the world needs to be aware of this. Uh, this is the culmination of this body of evidence for expanded eligibility. And I mean, what it really comes down to is um, improved access for our patients in terms of uh, the life-saving and life-changing uh, interventions that we offer. 
Um, thank you, Shanu. And uh, maybe uh, I want to ask uh, Scott after his presentation. Um, you you mentioned to us, Scott, that the old guidelines were mostly based on opinion and experience, with very little input from from surgeons on surgical guidelines and the new guidelines are mostly based on science and evidence. Is there an expectation that researchers who are going to publish moving forward, that they will have to use their, uh, the new guidelines when they, when they write and, 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 and publish you know, new, new literature moving forward? I think absolutely. I think we have to stand by what we, what we did when we put this project together and what we learned from it. Uh, if we don't use the new guidelines, then it wastes it was a waste of all that time to make them in the first place. Plus, they represent the best data out there and best practice out there of how to do safe and reliable, minimally invasive metabolic and bariatric surgery. So I think by all means, and I think it would also be important for both societies and both journals to declare up front that they're going to be following the guidelines. Excellent. Uh, now, the next uh, talk that we're going to have is uh, the history of the 1991 NIH consensus statement in the past consensus statement and guidelines presented by Lillian Co. Hello, everyone. I'm going to present to you the history of the 1991 NIH consensus statement and discuss some past consensus statements and guidelines. From 1978 to 1991, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, hosted consensus conferences organized for the purpose of summarizing the state of knowledge in the field of metabolic and bariatric surgery as determined by an evolving panel of experts who reviewed reliable published scientific literature and presentations. The third NIH consensus conference in 1991, with its subsequent statement, was seminal events in the development and acceptance of bariatric surgery as an appropriate treatment for severe obesity and its related diseases. This NIH consensus statement of 1991, as listed here, are the recommended criteria for consideration for bariatric surgery. The decision was based on a prudent evaluation of the risk-benefit ratio, but notably the studies that led to these recommendations were based on the era of open surgery with few surgical options, and no reference to results of high-level evidence describing the procedure's effects on specific treatment groups. In 1998, the NIH assembled a panel of experts in obesity and health policy to examine emerging criteria for the construction of newer evidence-based guidelines. The panelists, none of them surgeons, did not consider the laparoscopic approach to the procedures, which is known to decrease the incidence of complications, made no mention of the implementation of national accreditation, and did not consider the clinical evidence base on randomized controlled trials. The panel found no basis to alter the conclusions of the 1991 consensus panel and issued guidelines that mirrored recommendations from the 1991 consensus panel. In 2007, the NIH appointed a new expert panel, including one surgeon, to update the 1998 guidelines. Criteria for selection of the research papers to comprise the evidence were refined. Reports from the Swedish Obesity Study Trial as well as the Longitudinal Assessment of Bariatric Surgery Lab Studies were included among the papers comprising the evidence base. Following a prolonged five-year process, the panel issued the NIH Systematic Evidence Review from the Obesity Expert Panel and referred the review and publication of any additional guidelines to the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and the Obesity Society. Hence, 
NIH had no official medical or surgical position, consensus statement or guidelines regarding the treatment of obesity from, 20, from 2007 onwards. So in 2013, when the NIH formally retired the consensus development program, they concluded the organization of consensus conferences of any type. As a result, the 1991 consensus statement it was still not updated. So remember, the NIH referred the process to three associations in 2007 the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and the Obesity Society. After a prolonged five-year process, the panelists, who had only one surgeon member, came out with this report. And they also received endorsement from many non-surgical associations. And the evidence was judged to be inefficient to either endorse or discourage surgical intervention for patients with a BMI less than 35. This was because the evidence based at the time of the systematic literature review omitted the multiple RCTs that address metabolic and surgical intervention for patients with type 2 diabetes and lower BMI. So once again, there was no update to the 1991 consensus statement. If so, it's a federation of 72 national societies and more than 10,000 members. If so, has the vision to optimize the control of adiposity-based chronic diseases and the mission to unify the global scientific, surgical and integrated health communities for the purpose of dissemination of knowledge collaboration and establishing universal standards of care for the treatment of individuals with adiposity-based chronic disease. Position statements are also issued by IFSO to provide opinion and guidance based upon current knowledge, experience and availability of resources as well as patient acceptance and perceived risk-benefit ratio. Of recent times, two position statements on indications of bariatric surgery has been issued by IFSO. In 2014, a position statement with 10 recommendations supporting bariatric surgery in patients with a lower BMI of, 20, of 30 to 35. And in 2016, updated the IFSO position statement on the safety and efficacy of surgery for obesity and weight-related diseases and expanded its recommendations to treat not only obesity but the associated metabolic conditions, in particular type 2 diabetes. 14 obesity-related comorbidities were listed in the recommendations. Similarly, the ASMBS is the largest national scientific organization in the U.S. with more than 4,000 members dedicated to metabolic and bariatric surgery has issued many position statements. Position statements on safety and profile of the bariatric surgery for patients with lower BMI 30 to 35 was firstly in 2013. This was updated in 2018 with additional high quality data supporting bariatric surgery in class 1 obesity and position statements on medium and long-term outcomes following weight loss in patients with diabetes. Similarly, relationship of obesity with cancer and the role of weight loss surgery, the impact of metabolic and bariatric surgery on non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. In 2011, following a consensus statement with 44 bariatric experts at the second IFSO Asia-Pacific Chapter Congress, a consensus statement was produced supporting a lower BMI threshold for Asian patients, and they're listed here. So over the last 15 years, metabolic surgery, diabetes surgery, bariatric surgery has been shown to achieve superior glycemic control and reduction of cardiovascular risk factors in obese patients with type 2 diabetes compared with various medical lifestyle and interventions. 
In 2016, following the second Diabetes Surgery Summit, which convened a multidisciplinary group of 45 clinicians to develop global guidelines on metabolic surgery, a joint statement was issued. That is, metabolic surgery should be considered for patients with type 2 diabetes and a BMI 30 to 35 if hyperglycemia is inadequately controlled despite optimal treatment with either oral or injected, injectable medications. This recommendation is now in the American Diabetes Association Standards of Medical Care in Diabetes 2022. Bariatric surgery worldwide has been to date largely governed by the NIH consensus statement published in 1991. These recommendations have been enormously influential and clinically useful worldwide, but they are outdated and crying out for revision. Many additional sets of guidelines and recommendations will continue to be articulated by if so, ASMBS and societies worldwide. The question now is not whether bariatric surgery is valuable for severely obese individuals, because it is, but whether it will benefit people with lower BMIs with or without comorbidities. And that's why we are here today with the new ASMBS, if so, guidelines on indications for metabolic and bariatric surgery 20. 22. Excellent. Uh, Lillian, thank you. So I have a, a quick question for you. Um, so you made it very clear how the NIH got out of the business of doing guidelines, basically. Um, and I, I still wonder, what would it be like to have another NIH um, guidelines because the first ones were mainly based by consensus and not necessarily by level of evidence data. And now that we have these uh, new guidelines that have more evidence-based uh, statements, do you think the acceptance in the world will be faster with these guidelines just because we have evidence instead of a consensus or just because the other ones were NIH, you know, they had a lot of traction. Uh, what do you think? Do you think it would be a faster acceptance now? If you go back 30 years, I guess the NIH had a lot of influence, but they do not have that consensus panel anymore. So we, if so, and ASMBS are really one of the biggest federation and, and societies in the world. And we've come together with all the data, with all the... all all the information that we've come up with these guidelines. I can't see how anyone can ignore these guidelines to move forward. Thank, thank you, Lillian. Um, um, so, so next uh, we will have uh, the president-elect of IFSO, uh, Professor Gerhard uh, uh, Prager, uh, talk to us about what is wrong with the previous 1991 um, NIH uh, guidelines. So Gerhard, please go ahead. Dear colleagues, it's my pleasure to share with you a few thoughts on the question, what is wrong with the previous guidelines? As mentioned already, the old guidelines were published in 1991, which is an incredible 31 years ago. Nevertheless, these old outdated guidelines are still used by healthcare providers, insurance companies, and policymakers to give access for our patients to the most powerful treatment of obesity and comorbidities, which is bariatric metabolic surgery. These old guidelines deal with operations that are abandoned nowadays, like the vertical banded gastroplasty, but also the BPD. And the way how we do the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass nowadays differs from the way it was done in the 70s and 80s. Keep in mind, 31 years ago, the world was a different world. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed and the World Wide Web, the internet, became commercially available. And even the NIH itself mentioned just a few years later 
that these 1991 guidelines should not be used anymore. So what is now the difference between the old and the new guidelines? What is wrong nowadays from a current perspective with these old guidelines? They are eminence-based. This was an, an expert consensus meeting. The new guidelines are evidence-based. The data for the old guidelines were open surgeries by laparotomy gathered in the 70s and 80s, whereas the basis for our new guidelines are minimally invasive procedures. Many uh, people already applying enhanced recovery after surgery. These surgeries are done by laparoscopy, robotic, or even endoscopic. The old guidelines base on small case series, whereas the new guidelines implement big data coming from registries and high volume centers. In the old guidelines, we only do have a few small size RCTs, whereas nowadays we face meta-analysis and multi-center prospective randomized control trials. And maybe most important, the old guidelines focus purely on weight loss, on bariatric surgery. The new guidelines try to implement the whole picture, the metabolic disease, especially diabetes. So the new era of metabolic surgery. And last but not least, the age barrier or age limit of the old guidelines has also been removed in the new guidelines. Let me summarize. The guidelines from 1991 are a huge barrier and do prevent access for our patients to the safest, most effective, and one of the most studied operations in medicine, that is metabolic surgery. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard, for uh, uh, succinctly uh, telling us why the old guidelines uh, had had issues. You know, I I wonder, you know, with your with your summary that the new guidelines are evidence based. They look at minimally invasive surgery. They've looked at registries, big data, multi-center trials, and more importantly, metabolic surgery. Why do you think it took 30 years for this to happen? Uh, I'm interested to know your thoughts. Well, this is a tough question. I think there are many factors that complement to that. Um, uh, we do face very different uh, healthcare systems all over the world. So the needs are also very different all over the world. Um, it makes a difference whether you have a strong public healthcare system or maybe private insurance companies run the whole story. Um, why it took so long, I cannot precisely answer. So honestly, I think it would have been time already some 10 or 15 years ago. So it's really urgent need to uh, write these new guidelines. And I'm very enthusiastic to see healthcare providers and insurance companies to accept these guidelines, but also other medical specialist organizations like uh, the internists, the endocrinologists, the diabetologists, the cardiologists. I think this will give much more power to our new guidelines. Well, well stated. I think I'll introduce uh, Dan. You're muted. Sorry about that. So um, next we have uh, Professor uh, Dan uh, Eisenberg uh, from uh, um, Stanford, uh, who's gonna uh, talk to us uh, about the process of creating the evidence-based new guidelines and how they were done. Uh, Dan, please go ahead. Good morning and good afternoon. I am Dan Eisenberg from Stanford School of Medicine and the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System and recent chair of the Clinical Issues Committee of the ASMBS. I will give a brief description of the process for creating the 2022 ASMBS IFSO guidelines. This process started approximately 15 months ago with a thorough review of the 1991 NIH consensus statement on gastrointestinal surgery for severe obesity, with the idea to outline 
potential gaps between the 1991 NIH statement and the accumulated research knowledge and current clinical practice. To this end, a task force was convened composed of 24 international leaders of metabolic and bariatric surgery. Nine members were from ASMBS, 15 members were from IFSO. They represented nine countries from different geographic regions, including Australia, Europe, the Middle East, North America, and South America. Several clinical areas were identified that were narrowed down to six main areas, or gaps, which needed to be addressed. They included the implementation of BMI thresholds, the approach to patients at extremes of age, the role of metabolic and bariatric surgery as a bridge to other therapy, metabolic and bariatric surgery in high-risk patients, the preoperative evaluation of the candidate for surgery, and reporting on the long-term safety and efficacy of metabolic and bariatric surgery, data which was not available in 1991. We thus performed an extensive review of the English language literature relevant to these specific areas, amounting to several hundred manuscripts which were closely reviewed. We gave highest priority to studies that were randomized clinical trials and to cohort studies that were large and or reported on mid to long term outcomes and published within the last 10 to 15 years. We gave lowest priority to small case series and case reports to produce a working draft. This working draft then underwent several rounds of review, comment, and revision within the task force, resulting in a preliminary draft. This, in turn, was subject to independent review within each respective society. If so, with its approximately 10,000 members, and ASMBS representing more than 4,000 members. The ASMBS review began with the members of the Executive Council of the Executive Committee. When deemed ready, the draft was sent to the Executive Committee for review and comment before being sent to the ASMBS membership at large. Reviewer comments were then addressed by the task force before being sent back to the Executive Council of the Executive Committee. Final approval by the Executive Committee was required for the draft to be complete. Similarly, the review, comment, and revision process within IFSO began with a review by its 15-member Scientific Committee, which sets in motion an iterative process of review between the Scientific Committee and the Task Force members. The draft is ultimately reviewed by the Executive Board and final approval by the IFSO Executive Board is required for the draft to be considered complete. The two drafts, the one with comments and edits from ASMBS and the one with comments and edits from IFSO, were then sent back to the task force to produce the final product, the 2022 American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and International Federation for the Surgery of Obesity and Metabolic Disorders, Indications for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for, for, uh, for an excellent outline. Uh, and uh, Jaime, you're, you're back. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm back. I'm <laughs> trying to get my video on. So Dan, uh, that was very interesting uh, presentation of how the guidelines were developed. Um, I like the fact that they're uh, easy to read, simple. They're very easy to follow. And I think most of the insurance policies and, um, you know, our colleagues in general will be easy to follow that instead of having a very complex document. I was want to ask you, when you were creating these guidelines, and I know that a high level of evidence, randomized clinical trials play a big weight, but how much weight does it uh, play real data like uh, from databases, like we have in the United States, the MBSA QIP databases or many other registers in the world, do that play a role in the in the developing the guidelines or it's only when that are, is published? 
Yeah, it, that's a great question. And the, the idea was for the recommendations to really be dictated by uh, the published accumulated evidence. Um, one that is um, publicly available um, and uh, really overwhelming uh, over the last several decades. And the approach was really to make it a highly collaborative effort um, that was by design um, with multiple opportunities throughout for review, comment, revision, and uh, reassessment of the quality of uh, the evidence that we're relying on in order to make um, any kind of recommendations. So it was really driven by the accumulation of the available data. Thank you. Fantastic. So, so now that you've heard how the guidelines were put together, you've heard what's wrong with the old guidelines. I think uh, it is next for the current president of ASMBS, Teresa Lemaster, to actually unveil these guidelines and tell us exactly uh, what the guidelines are. So Teresa, please go ahead. Thank you for allowing me to present the new ASMBS If So Guidelines on the Indications for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery 2022 and how the indications have changed from the NIH Consensus Conference Guidelines. As was previously stated, this project was undertaken to bring the indications for bariatric surgery up to date with the current evidence on safety and outcomes. There have been tremendous advances in bariatric surgery in the past 30 years since the 1991 NIH guidelines. The NIH no longer issues guidelines, so it was necessary to take a different approach. A literature review was performed to incorporate the most up-to-date evidence. Procedure type, age limits, and indications were all evaluated. The evidence from the literature review demonstrated the most common procedures currently performed worldwide are the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy and the laparoscopic loop and Y gastric bypass. Other procedures include the biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch and the one anastomosis gastric bypass. The laparoscopic adjustable gastric band has decreased in volume overall and the vertical band of gastroplasty has become relevant pretty much only for revisions and as a historical procedure. Metabolic bariatric surgery demonstrates substantial improvement and resolution of many significant obesity-related comorbidities with outstanding safety outcomes. Prospective and large retrospective studies support the use of metabolic bariatric surgery to treat class one obesity due to the improved longevity, comorbidity resolution, and improved quality of life. It's been demonstrated that earlier treatment of type two diabetes with surgical treatment leads to greater remission. The current indications of metabolic bariatric surgery include class one obesity with a BMI of 30 to 34.9 with related health medical problems, or class two obesity with a BMI greater than 35, regardless of the presence or absence of comorbidities. It's also been identified that people of Asian descent experience development of type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease at a lower BMI threshold than the non-Asian population related to the degree of adiposity. Therefore, the BMI thresholds are adjusted to reflect risk in the specific ethnic population with the obesity being defined as a BMI of 25 to 27.5. Metabolic bariatric surgery has been demonstrated to be very safe and can be performed in those with advanced age, including those greater than 70 years old, with only a slightly higher complication rate compared with those of the younger population. There's a very significant benefit of weight loss and health-related outcomes in this population, and patient selection is related to other factors instead of age, including frailty, cognitive capacity, and end organ function. A total risk benefit ratio should be evaluated. Also, more children and adolescents carry the burden of disease of obesity, increasing the risk of premature death in adulthood. Metabolic bariatric surgery is safe and effective in this population with far greater benefits than non-surgical treatment. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the ASMBS guidelines recommend metabolic bariatric surgery to be considered for children and adolescents 
with a BMI greater than 120% of the 95th percentile with major comorbidities, or a BMI greater than 140th percent of the 95th percentile without comorbidities, or class 3 obesity. There are also special populations that can benefit significantly from metabolic bariatric surgery, acting as a bridge to become a candidate for other procedures that have limitations for patient selection related to BMI or health-related comorbidities to improve outcomes. These include a bridge to joint replacement, abdominal wall hernia repair, and organ transplantation. Metabolic bariatric surgery has also been demonstrated to be safe and very effective in other high-risk populations, including patients with a BMI greater than 60, those with liver cirrhosis, and those with heart failure, even to the point of requiring a left ventricular assist device. So in conclusion, the evidence supports expanded indications for metabolic bariatric surgery across age range and risk profiles due to the outstanding efficacy, durability, and safety to treat this life-threatening disease. We look forward to helping people with the disease of obesity live longer and live better following metabolic bariatric surgery. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, thank you, Teresa, for uh, for an excellent presentation of the new guidelines. Um, you know, we 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 all know that BMI is not the end all be all, and I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on what were the reasons behind decreasing the BMI threshold from 40 to 35, and 35 to 30, and and lower for the Asian population. Sure, I think this is probably one of the most important things that relates to the updated guidelines. And I think the number one driver is the safety and efficacy of bariatric surgery. That has shifted dramatically. And so we also understand the earlier we treat this disease, the better the results. If we wait until somebody's very, very severe and extreme in their disease, essentially we're just pulling them back from the edge of the cliff. But if we can treat them much earlier in their disease, we can truly transform what their next 20, 30 years looks like. So the biggest, I think, shift in evidence is that we should be using surgical treatment much earlier in this disease process with very safe and effective um, outcomes. Great, so, so earlier treatment due to safety and efficacy, great, excellent. So I think it's, it's time for the, uh, uh, you know, the attendees to send us their questions. Please post them in the, in the Q&A, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, and I think we already have questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jaime to, to maybe start with the questions that we already have, and please uh, uh, post questions in the Q&A function. So Jaime. Yes, uh, thank you. So so there's, there's very good questions, several questions there. So I'm gonna combine questions about insurance because there's several questions on that, you know, questions about will insurance recognize this? How long would it take? Were these guidelines sent to CMS or to the payers? Uh, should we start citing these guidelines when we request insurance authorization? So it's just a combination of questions about insurance. So I'm gonna ask that question directly to the US surgeons, base surgeons, you know, Shanu, Teresa, what do you think about those uh, insurance aspects? Yeah, well, that's, uh, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Ponce. And thank you for those <clears throat> uh, of you in the, who've uh, logged in to, to, for this uh, historic event uh, for our special team. Um, um, the question is, what's different now as to attempts at this in the past? So uh, I think the answer is it's to be determined. It's, it's up to uh, the 720 participants on this webinar, um, those who will be watching it later, those watching it on social media live right now as well. It's going to be a grassroots effort, I think, to turn the tide. And so um, this is your ammunition when you go up against the payers for your peer-to-peer. -peer. Ask them, do they quote 31-year-old guidelines for cardiology, for stroke care, for VTE prophylaxis, and things of that nature? The answer is no. So this is the contemporary uh, evidence-based, uh, best evidence guideline that is available. And uh, it'll be up to our membership to... Um, help push this through um, and sharing it in your informational seminars and your colleagues in uh, medical professions. And particularly when you have peer-to-peers uh, with the payers, 
and see what their answers are, because you will see that their and their defense will be based in discrimination and not in evidence if they still don't adopt this. I mean, if I can add to that, uh, the insurance companies are businesses and they have a fiduciary responsibility to not waste money. It's very easy for them to argue opinion so that we always lost those battles because opinion is opinion, but they can't now argue science. And now we are fully loaded with the science to demonstrate what we're saying is correct. And it's gonna be much harder for them, I think, to argue back against it. So Jaime, I think um, part of this is on our shoulders as a responsibility for not just our members, but also our leadership to communicate it very well too. So we do have a campaign to make sure that those payers, CMS, um, even in education models, medical schools, residencies, other societies know about these guidelines. It does take a while for penetrance, but I do think that every time we're asked, we need to reference the guidelines. And just like Shauna was saying, every single time we need to bring it up. We need to send it out to these insurance uh, medical directors who may not be aware yet. Um, and we can do it in a very um, uh, kind and supportive way um, rather than combative to start, you know, and, and encourage them to get on board with what is the current evidence? What's the best treatment for patients? Um, we, we can get the stick out later if, if the uh, carrot doesn't work. Um, but I, my first step is really educate and really get the word out because a lot of people really aren't aware of how safe and effective bariatric surgery is. Right. So, so, so educate uh, to get the message through. So the next question is from Dr. Nissen, um, and he has two questions, and maybe we'll ask uh, Lillian, Dan, and Gerhard uh, to, to weigh in. His question is about whether these guidelines include experimental or endoscopic procedures. Now, um, we know these are different, um, but he's interested in, in both those types of procedures. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and I'll, I'll say that the emphasis again in, in these guidelines were on the heaviest and meatiest uh, of data and science. So by their nature, the experimental procedures um, are in the uh, data accumulation phase. So we, we did not prioritize those in these guidelines. I think especially as we have no long-term data, we don't have RCTs, we don't have big case series. So as Dan mentioned, uh, we rely on the, on the most commonly performed operations. And I think with time, as more studies are being done on these emerging procedures, we will have more data and therefore we will come up with better recommendations. So, is something for the future, not quite yet right now. Right, and I think, I think there is also like a similar question, which probably uh, begs a similar answer from Nicholas Bertha about revisions. And I think most likely the panels would agree it's, it's the same process. This is something you have to wait for more data to, to be able to look at. Right, that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> Hi, Nick. So I was looking at, um... Again, combining uh, several questions. This is very interesting questions. Um, so uh, there's questions about if the evidence that is on the guidelines include world data and not only US data. And also to expand on that question, there's several questions about the Asian population. How do you define Asian, define Asian population? Uh, there's some comments there that Asians include many races and so, which countries exactly are you talking about when you say Asian? Um, and, and if it's the world data versus USA data. Dan, you want to yeah, start with comments it, and then Lillian, maybe? Sure, I'll, I'll just uh, quickly mention it. It's, it's definitely uh, worldwide data. Um, we were uh, motivated by quality of evidence, uh, certainly not by uh, geography. Um, so uh, so that's that's that first part of the question. Um, I'll, I'll defer to Lillian if she wants to jump in, but with the regarding the Asian data, it's absolutely true um, that uh, Asian uh, population is a is a diverse one. 
nonetheless, there is um, some good data and also coming out of the World Health Organization of uh, reassessing BMI thresholds in special populations with the Asian population being um, the exemplary one. Lillian, you, you want to comment on the Asian population? Yeah, I guess if you look around the world, you know, he, the, the, the Asian population is very wide, um, but we are talking about people of Asian descent that are probably more predisposed to the conditions of obesity more than, you know, the, the non-Asians. So these are the data that has been emerging over the last few years, showing that people of Asian descent are more susceptible to um, obesity-based diseases. So the, the, the next question is also about insurance. There are actually three questions about insurance. Maybe we'll ask them one at a time. The first is from Vivek Prachan, second from Selwan Barabat and the third from Phil Shower. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, so Vivek is, is uh, first congratulating the group for the work and thank you for that, Vivek. And then he's asking, maybe I'll, I'll have Shanu answer that. Have the revised guidelines been shared with CMS, which is the largest insurance carrier in the US or private payers in the US? Should, should programs be citing these revised guidelines in their requests for insurance authorization? Maybe Shanu, while you're there, you can just touch on the question of Selwan of how long it took for insurance to follow the old guidelines as a prelude to what you think will happen with the new ones? Uh, all great questions. Um, I think I, the, the, the latter first, I don't know. Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, 1991 was a, a significant year also for me because I was graduating from college. So <laughs> I don't know um, where, uh, where the adoption curve was there. We know from other things, from technology, it's about 17 years for innovation, for the technology to, to curve to, to uh, catch up uh, with adoption. So uh, hopefully we're not waiting that long. We've been waiting a long time uh, in the fields of metabolic and surgery surgery to be, to be accepted, if you will. Um, we have plenty of evidence now, so I'm excited about this initiative um, and moving forward with it. The, uh, with regards to uh, rollout to pairs, not yet. This is this is the rollout. This is to uh, um, our frontline folks, which is all of our uh, those of us in, the, in our respective membership. Uh, but that will be coming forthcoming, where we will uh, beginning to put this together so that we can go to the payers and particularly CMS. As you know, most third party payers in the U.S. follow what CMS does, so we know that's the. That's the hill that we're going to have to uh, climb uh, to see if we can get the various other third party payers to to follow suit as well. What I'd really like to see is at a local level, those of us who have our own health plans, if our own health systems are promoting our bergic and metabolic surgery programs, then and, but we have our own health plans, those are the health plans that should be the first to adopt this. If they really believe in what we are doing, that will show the rest of the world uh, that not only do they see the benefits for the patients, but they're seeing this from a population health standpoint that this is beneficial and we're going to adopt the new guidelines. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'm going to ask uh, this to the potentially to both leaders of the SMBS. And, and if so, uh, there are some questions, um, including from Phil Shower and others, uh, about an endorsement from other non surgical societies and or if this has been shared on their websites or colleagues uh, from other medical societies, non-surgical, and what is the plan in the future for that? Sure, so I can start with that. So um, we always welcome the uh, collaboration and endorsement with other societies, and certainly this will be shared with them. Um, we did not want to delay getting the guidelines out to work through that process ahead of time because it is a complex process that takes uh, can take a long time. And the guidelines were under embargo and they're just released today. So we can send them out um, starting today to other societies. But we would look for endorsement. We have built bridges with many other societies over time and understanding the benefits of metabolic and bariatric surgery and that we are partners together in treating this disease. So I, I do think we've made a lot of bridges um, and collaboration over time. And certainly I think those things will be forthcoming. 
Yeah, well said, Teresa. The only thing I'll add to that is that both organizations have a long history of working with our sister and uh, uh, related uh, medical societies. This today is just step number one. And what you're asking about is maybe step three or four or five down the road, but absolutely we'll share this with anybody who's willing to sit down with us and talk about it. And then uh, just to dovetail on what they both shared, um, our, our medical colleagues did recently, uh, this past week, release updated guidelines for around medical management. Um, and um, they did pick up, uh, get a national news story in the US uh, on ABC News. Um, but it was good to see that they, when they talked about that, they endorsed our new guidelines around the thresholds for surgery was, was uh, mentioned by them uh, as well. So that was great to see. Right, so Excellent. Uh, there is, there is a, a question about the utilization of bariatric surgery and, and how low it is an analogy made to if the utilization of let's say cancer surgery would, would have been how, how would people react from uh, Rajesh Agrawal? And his, his question is about what is our, our strategy uh, to be able to not only get the guidelines uh, instituted more, but strategies alongside cost reduction uh, and, and, and getting more utilization. So maybe we'll have either Lillian or Gerhard uh, Give us their, their thoughts. This, I think this is, of course, a very tough question. Uh, as already mentioned, uh, uh, policymakers, healthcare providers must uh, face these new guidelines as their basis for the decision making. And on the other hand, what we see in the recent years is uh, more even even short stay or even day surgery. And this will reduce the cost further and might also enable that more people have access to that type of treatment. I think this, this is the way we have seen the last 30 years, we have seen a reduction in trauma in surgery by minimizing the excess. And this goes on this story with maybe the new procedures even endoscopically done on an outpatient basis. And this might enable uh, that more patients, more people suffering from the disease have access to the most efficient treatment. And of course, on the other hand, as already mentioned, we need our partners, the World Obesity Federation, the IDF, the ADA, the IASO, the EAS, and so on and so on, to endorse our new guidelines because this will give them much more power. Excellent. I wanted to ask uh, another uh, set of questions about BMI or using steel BMI as one of the indicators uh, for surgery. And uh, many have mentioned the fact that we are moving some medical societies are moving to use more percentage of body fat, um, moving uh, to use adiposity beyond BMI. And uh, another question was, does there was any uh, consideration on evaluating staging of obesity using like the Edmonton obesity staging system or other different systems instead of just pure BMI? wanted to ask uh, the more involved in the writing, you know, Dan and Scott, what do you think about the BMI use still? Well, obviously it's simple. It can be done in the office. It doesn't have a cost to it. So it's very attractive. It, it actually is beneficial for looking at large populations for epidemiological studies. But if looking at it as a marker for who can or can't have surgery, it's awful. I mean, what's the big difference between a BMI of 34 who gets turned down for surgery and a BMI of 36 who gets accepted? They may be identical. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. We do need to come up with something better. And hopefully this uh, project that we just completed would enable us to then move forward with other projects to look at what's better than BMI, what's gonna be more uh, accurate and serve more patients. Yeah, I would just add that absolutely BMI is a, uh, BMI thresholds are, are not a, a scientific measure by, by any means, but um, we are reflecting current practice and without a doubt BMI is, 
uh, what we're using now, um, and uh, that's the relevant measure in uh, trying to interpret current data and uh, uh, provide some recommendation for access and treatment. So there, there, there are a couple of questions about the preoperative workup, uh, specifically, you know, uh, standardization of preoperative evaluation by psychology and dietitian, and whether the guidelines touch on 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 these items. Um, and you know, anyone from the group can jump in and, and give us their feedback. Sure, there's definitely a section on patient evaluation and preparation, and the importance <laughs> of continuing to use our multidisciplinary team, especially including dietitians, mental health providers. It really is a team a page, uh, approach to care. And that patient, not just evaluation, but preparation for surgery is really key. And so there is a section on that as well. And talking about, you know, the initial guidelines excluded a lot of just very broadly excluded mental health disorders. And we know that there are many people with mental health disorders who can do very well uh, with metabolic bariatric surgery. Some should be appropriately excluded, but some can very safely be included and do very well. So it does address those as points as well. Great points. And I think while, while you're there, Teresa, if you can uh, just relist the new indications based on BMI, someone is asking specifically to have that, uh, you know, just, just revisit it and, and restate it. Sure. So for class one obesity, that's a BMI of 30 to 35 with significant health comorbidities. And then uh, greater than a BMI of 35, even if there's an absence of comorbidities, which I think is really important because there are still several insurance um, carriers who will state that if they have a BMI less than 40, they must have three comorbidities and it, it needs to be a hypertension on three medications or craziness. Um, where essentially they're waiting until a patient is unsafe to operate on before they say that it's indicated. So this is a, a big shift from that uh, philosophy and understanding that when patients are actually earlier in their disease and better optimized, that's when they're safer to operate on, not waiting until they're at the, the end stages of their disease. We wouldn't wait to help somebody with renal failure until they're on dialysis. You know, we would intervene much earlier. So we need to do that here too. Yeah, like for instance, diabetes, if we operate on them late in the course, the operations are not that effective for resolving diabetes. But if we get to the patient earlier, it is effective. Exactly. <clears throat> so there was a question um, about why we we're not including uh, obesity medicine into these uh, guidelines and the combination of uh, metabolic inverted surgery with GLP-1 agonist included in the guidelines. And, you know, one of my thoughts is, you know, the level of evidence that we have on that, but, you know, any thoughts, Shanu, on that? Yeah, like I said, they recently, just in this past week, with, um, our medical colleagues released guidelines. I mean, I think um, it's such a broad topic that I think, you know, this is, we, we, we took on this challenge here around increased eligibility based on our surgical interventions. Um, and even right now, we know worldwide, we're about the 1% penetrance of eligibility, but we have just expanded the denominator. So 1% now of millions of more people who now suddenly qualify for um, that which we provide. Um, uh, it's an adjunct to uh, our medical colleagues who have recently uh, released theirs around, again, updated uh, medication use in the, the, those roles as well. But what I really think uh, is uh, important is how we operationalize this. Meaning I think there should be a follow-up webinar for our integrated health colleagues uh, to see how would this impact their practice and what it would be like taking on patients with uh, a lower BMI, um, perhaps elderly, some of these other indications that we've sort of been uh, trapped from in the past. So I think I would look forward to seeing how they operationalize that, what it would take to, in terms of the impact on their practices um, as well moving forward. And Jaime, I do think that your question is very important because I do think the future is combined multimodal therapy. It's just the data is still emerging on how to actually do that effectively. Yeah. So we need we need people publishing. Lots and lots of people are doing this in their practice. I do this in my practice. 
but then we need more data published to be able to create guidelines. You know, people ask me all the time to, to give them an algorithm, but we still have a lot of access issues for medication. So that um, impedes giving a very solid algorithm because our step one is oftentimes, what can we get for this patient um, rather than what would we like to use? Um, so that's definitely a field that's emerging. I really appreciate the OMA putting out uh, new guidelines and giving us help in that area. But I think that is for the next iteration of the guidelines, we should have a lot more data and evidence to guide us hmm. of how to do that effectively. And one I more, agree. One more ask, Jaime, uh, and it's great that we have uh, Scott Schwer as the senior editor of Obesity Surgery. Uh, our two leading journals being that being SWORD and Obesity Surgery is um, moving forward now for those of us who like to uh, publish uh, in this space. Um, we will no, no longer be referencing the 1991 uh, guidelines in your methodology uh, of your paper. Your patients need to meet these 2022 ASMBS, uh, if so, indications for metabolic and barrier surgery guidelines. And these are the references that you should be putting forth in the literature moving forward as well. That's one other um, piece of the puzzle as we move forward to kind of do away with the antiquated 1991 guidelines. And I think following up on those answers, you know, I think it's important for us to not close the guidelines right now. I mean, this needs to be an updated more often instead of waiting, you know, 30 yeah. plus years. You know, I think more often updates based on new data. And I think that will serve also to update other things, you know, like the MBSA QIP criteria and other things that have been asked on the questions, but more often updates as the data come by. Fantastic. So, so great, great questions from the from the audience. And as you guys heard, this is the beginning, hopefully, of uh, a new era for our for our field. Um, I want to thank my co-moderator Jaime for uh, his time today, and and not forget to thank the team behind the scenes that uh, got this together from both ASMBS and IFSO, and have an opportunity to thank the current and future leaders of IFSO and ASMBS. Teresa Lemaster, Shano Kothari, Dan Eisenberg, Scott Shukora, Lillian Cow, and Gerhard Prager. And from me, Abderrahman Nimeri, it's really been my pleasure and privilege. And uh, thanks everyone for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.